Let's now look at what happens when we solve the Schrodinger equation for the harmonic oscillator. So to remind ourselves, we've got a model system here where we have an atom with mass 1 and another atom with mass 2. They are separated by some distance r and they have some force of some spring with some spring constant k holding them together in a quadratic potential. And the position coordinate we're using is x equals r minus r naught, where r naught is some equilibrium bond length. So any displacement away from this bond length is going from this equilibrium bond length is going to be an increase in potential energy. So up here I've got my Schrodinger equation, the standard minus h bar squared over two times mass, second derivative of the wave function with respect to x, plus potential energy times the wave function equals energy times the wave function. The standard eigenvalue problem of the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function gives the energy times the wave function. So what about this system do we need to specifically plug in to our system, to our equation here? Well, for mass, we showed the last video that we're going to use the reduced mass of the system, which is just m1 times m2, their product over their sum, m1 plus m2. We showed what consequences that has for what value of mass ends up getting plugged in here. And the potential uh, we have is that v of x, this displacement coordinate x, is 1 half kx squared. It is a quadratic potential in both directions, both two, both a bond length too short and too long has the same potential if they're off by the same amount. Okay, so plugging that in, we're going to have minus h bar squared, reduce Planck's constant over 2 mu, second derivative of psi with respect to x plus 1 half kx squared, not e, psi, psi of x equals e psi of x, and this energy is what we're trying to solve in addition to this wave function. Okay, so doing some rearrangement of this, we can end up with the expression that the second derivative of our wave function is going to be equal to minus 2 mu over h bar squared times the quantity e minus 1 half kx squared <coughs> times psi of x. Okay, so we have that the second derivative of a function equals a negative constant times a constant minus something which is very much not constant, this quadratic potential here. It varies with x, and then all of this times the function. So we can't solve this the way we've solved several other second order differential equations in this series because this part inside the parentheses here isn't a constant anymore. So uh, for the solutions of what the wave function is going to be, we're going to leave that for a little bit later. It's going to be slightly more complicated than the wave functions we've seen before, but still quite a nice closed functional form that we can understand. But what we're going to focus on in this video is primarily the energies of what we get when we solve this equation. So I'm not going to go through solving it. I'm just going to jump to the final result, which is that we get an energy which depends on some quantum number n. So there's a quantized set of allowed energies is equal to Planck's constant times a frequency and then times the product of the quantum number n, an integer, plus one half. And unlike particle in a box, this time this quantum number n runs from zero increasing. So it's an integer and it starts at zero. So that's something to keep in mind that often tricks people up. The first value for n in the harmonic oscillator is n equals zero. And this would be equivalent to writing h bar omega n plus one half. h bar is just h over two pi nu and omega is just uh, two pi times nu. So h bar omega and h nu are the same thing. But what about this this value of nu? Well, we saw in previous videos that this omega <coughs> is the square root of this spring constant and the potential k divided by the mass, which is mu. 
So omega is the square root of k over mu, and similarly nu is just omega over 2 pi. So nu is going to be 1 over 2 pi square root of k over mu. <clears throat> so the frequencies at which any diatomic molecule oscillate, the frequency at which they vibrate back and forth, is going to be proportional to the square root of how stiff this quadratic potential is that they act that they are existing in. And it's going to be inversely proportional to the square root of the reduced mass of the system. So making it heavier is going to make the frequencies lower, making the potential tougher is going to make the frequencies higher. Okay, so let's look at what this means in terms of the energy levels on a graph. Okay, so let's look at, let's see we have x equals zero there, we've got x, we've got e is increasing up here. Our potential function is just a parabola which acts around both sides of that, v of x. So what energy levels do we have? Well, we have, if we mark this off in terms of units of h nu, 2h nu, 3, 4, etc. At 1 half h nu, we have the n equals 0 state. And then at three halves, we have n equals one. At five halves, n equals two. Seven halves, n equals three, etc. So we have n equals zero, one, two, three. And we have the energy <coughs> equals one half h nu or h bar omega. Three halves. 5 halves, 7 halves, etc. So you see these energy levels are going to be evenly spaced together. That's in contrast to the uh, particle in a box where they were quadratically spaced. For the harmonic oscillator, we get energy levels which are evenly spaced apart. And you also notice that uh, these energies are displaced from the very bottom of the well here. And in fact, this is an important result because the ground state energy is for the energy of the lowest state is equal to one half h bar or one half h nu or h bar omega and this is called the zpve also called the zero point vibrational energy so the energy of the lowest state is not the bottom of the well, it's this one half h nu above the well. So when we have very when we have very light particles, this is going to be significant, the displacement above the well, because very light particles is going to give us a large value of nu, and the lighter it gets, the more and more displaced we are above the bottom of the well for the lowest energy state. And similarly, the stiffer the potential gets, the, the more narrow this parabola gets, the farther and farther these get above the lowest energy state. And this has an implication for dissociation energies, because if we plot V of R versus R for a realistic chemical system, we have the energy goes down, reaches some minimum, and then asymptotes out to R equals infinity. <coughs> Instead of being at the bottom, the very bottom of the well, the dissociation energy is not going to be this quantity here, which is called dE. It's going to be this quantity here called d0. So the amount of energy required to, to break this chemical bond, to separate these atoms infinitely apart, is the total width of the the total depth of the well minus that zero point vibrational energy. <clears throat> so this zero point vibrational energy decreases the amount of energy required to dissociate a chemical bond to get two bonds 
to break apart. And this has very big consequences for things like chemical reactions because requiring less energy for a bond to break apart is going to make reactions occur faster. And there's a whole host of other consequences of this, but that's just sort of an, an intro to what the zero point vibrational energy means in terms of chemistry when we use a harmonic oscillator to model uh, the lowest energy states of a chemical bond.